Welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry, and social justice. Hello, and welcome to the Madden America podcast. I'm Micah Engel, a doctoral student in psychology at the University of West Georgia, and a research news writer for the Madden America website. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Ian Pope, an instructor and research associate in anthropology at the University of Western Ontario in Ontario, Canada. Dr. Pepe's work focuses on the anthropology of First Nations peoples, global studies, and social justice and peace studies. He has done ethnographic work on Algonquin Provincial Park in Ontario, and specifically the relations between First Nation peoples and Canadian settler colonial society. This includes how the institution of Western psychiatric medicine affects First Nation peoples that it comes into contact with. Thank you for speaking with me, Dr. Pepe. Great to be with you, Micah. Right, so to start, tell me a little bit about your work that you've done in the area of indigenous rights. You know, how did you come to be interested in this area? I came to be interested in this in a pretty organic way, I would say. I was interested in finding a research topic where... I didn't feel that I was sort of interjecting myself into other people's concerns unfairly, that I wasn't walking into a situation and assuming that somehow I was going to make it better, and that I didn't go into a situation where I was making a target out of a community that I didn't feel deserved to be treated in that way or sort of sectioned off in such a isolated way. So when I decided on Algonquin Park, I was thinking about a place that I had always sort of felt connected to and somewhere that I had been told, you know, as a Canadian that I'm responsible for. It's an iconic place in the Canadian imagination. It's one of our largest and most visited tourist areas. And it's one of the oldest set aside protected areas in the country. Mm. So I thought, what better place to sort of organically involve myself than a place where I've already been invited to be involved. Mm. And the concerns with Indigenous issues came out of my recognition that they were being pushed aside, made invisible, obfuscated in various ways throughout the park in its representation of history, in the way that they talked about the the natural landscape as untouched and somehow pristine. Mm. I just thought uh, all of that was stuff that needed to be fleshed out. So I've been working on it now for about a decade. And so can you talk a little bit more about the indigenous rights or indigenous issues that you are looking at? Yeah. In and around Algonquin Park, it's not always obvious to people, but the place is named for the Algonquin people. Mm-hmm. In the act that set the, si- the park aside, the uh, so-called Kirkwood Commission pointed out that they wanted to protect the pristine wilderness, the headwaters of several rivers, that they needed a place for experimentation in forestry, is how they put it, um, that they would protect the animals, also a place of health resort, and lastly, somewhere that would memorialize the Algonquin people that were, quote, one of the greatest nations to walk the continent. Mm. And it made it sound like they were already gone, but I was pretty surprised to find out on one of my first visits to the park, or even in my preliminary research, that there had been a land claim surrounding most of the area of the park, all the way from the city of Ottawa, where the parliament buildings um, of the Canadian government sit, Mm. all the way up to a town called Mattawa, um, and down into the the sort of guts of the park, there was a land claim. Most people didn't know about it, and it had been basically inactive while the Algonquin communities had been building up their political power and their numbers by defining membership more carefully and sort of finding their relatives. So it became about Indigenous rights in the sense that There was often an opposition in the way that tourists and certain settler colonial locals spoke about indigenous issues in the park um, as if they were a threat. They spoke about, and this is sort of to quote them, Indians 
as people that couldn't be trusted, didn't look after the land, whatever else, all kinds of stereotypes would come out. And so in relationship to the land claim, often the folks who talked about it saw Indigenous involvement as a threat to the cont continuity, the integrity, the protection of the area. And I thought that that was kind of, I mean, hypocritical in a sense, yeah. since the park had been involved in forestry operations and really it was set aside to maintain the forestry industry. But not only that, that it, it hid and acted as if Indigenous people who were sort of traditionally related to the land, who thought about the land in different ways and who related to the land by being on it in careful and responsible ways, that all of them were already gone and that what we had now were sort of nothing more than legally recognized Indians mm. in Canada. Yeah, it sounds a little absurd. Well, it, yeah, it, to me it seemed pretty obvious, but it took a few minutes of doing some research and thinking about the representation of Indigenous people and the preparation of a background in anthropology and other disciplines that prepared me to sort of critically interrogate the representations that were given to me, even in a teaching scenario like the Algonquin Park Visitor Center and Museum. So you mentioned this idea of the settler colonial. Um, can you talk about that and how that, how it's distinguished from indigenous societies? Well, I mean, the, the borders are always fuzzy. Anthropologists yeah. are careful these days to point out that when we talk about a culture, we don't mean to isolate it and to right. suggest that somehow it exists within itself, that all the people are self-same or similar, that there's some sort of homogeneity. But there's broad strokes that seem to correspond to different lifestyles and the way that those lifestyles demonstrate a different apprehension of the world. Right. The way that we relate to the world is sort of embedded within these. And that sometimes the way that we talk about it can make obvious a very different relationship to the world. So I would suggest in some ways that my work has been focused on not pushing apart, but trying to find the cleavage between these different approaches, which I would broadly characterize as sort of an objective approach to the world, one that looks at the world as a set of things, often as resources to be made use of, and um, something more relational, literally a relational ontology. Great. So that was, that kind of leads into my next question. You talk in your work about sort of the, the Western white medical worldview, and I'm curious how you see that kind of playing out in some of your work uh, on the Algonquian people? Well, I mean, I'm involved in several projects, and the Algonquin are a community that's sort of a nation among larger nations. So the Algonquin are part of the Anishinaabe peoples. The Anishinaabe nation, in some cases, includes certain uh, Algonquin communities. So they're not isolated people. Anishinaabe um has many similarities with the dialect of Algonquin and the other Anishinaabe uh, dialects are often mutually intelligible. Mm. So there's a way of relating to the world that's embedded within that sort of language. And for the Algonquin, it's important that we consider things as sort of stemming from relationships which are either mutually beneficial, in some ways parasitic, but modeled upon what we see in the land, sort of a, a, a natural ethic. Mm -hmm. And that differs greatly from the approach that we see in Western biomedical models, allopathic medicine, where this objectivity is often assumed there's a thing at the root of an illness. And so we look for virus, bacteria. Often indigenous people would look to relationships that had been disturbed. In some ways, people might suggest this is because they don't know about viruses or bacteria. 
in other ways, it's that we've almost intentionally mistranslated the language to suggest that when they talk about the smallest of things, they're talking about spirits rather than these little people. And that's important because they see the world as peopled. And that's what I mean by a relational ontology. This gets to the work of some others like Eduardo Viveros de Castro, people who've worked on perspectivism. The notion of perspectivism suggests that all of the animals that we recognize see themselves as people in some ways. Mm -hmm. So, well, humans eat beaver and are eaten by spirits. Beaver see us as spirits and see themselves as people. And so they see their food in some ways as beaver. And there's this sort of uh, metonymy of scale that works through these ideas of relational ontology. And that means that when a hunter or a gatherer is successful, what they've done is aligned a relationship in a respectful way Mm -hmm. where just as at the end of a human life, we seem to give in rather than being overwhelmed. They suggest that a hunter doesn't necessarily succeed by getting an animal, but the animal takes pity on the hunter. Hmm. And it's because of this positive relationship, this respect between them, that the animal feels willing to give its life for the human community. And so that works very differently when we talk about issues of illness and disease, because it's often seen that there's a destabilized relationship at the root of the illness and that what needs to be done is to correct the behavior that led to the problem in the first place. And so it gets back to a much more, um, much more preliminary form of medicine where, where it's seen sort of public health isn't divided from medical interventions in quite the same way. Right. That's really interesting. So when it comes to kind of this biomedical perspective and institutions and whatnot encountering uh, the Algonquin people, what are the effects that you've seen? Well, some of the most violent effects have been the failure to recognize that medical treatments can often do more than alienate, but cause iatrogenetic effects, unexpected consequences where denigrating the approach to the world that particular patients, clients, whatever we might choose to represent them as, that denigrating that relationship to the world, that relational ontology, um, which can be done quite unintentionally by well-trained healers and healthcare practitioners, has a sort of compounding effect that works with the intergenerational trauma and the other effects related to things like residential schools, uh, forced relocation, and um, what we call in Canada the 60s scoop, which was um, a situation where a lot of Indigenous children were removed from their families because the families were characterized as not looking after them. Um, and this was predicated on parenting styles and a whole variety of things. But it, it led to a situation where um, we have uh, huge compounded traumatic effects that can be brought up again, triggered during therapy sessions and what have you, where sort of well-meaning healthcare practitioners can make reference to particular stereotypes or can make comments that seem to assume that particular people's way of approaching the world is wrong and that their way of thinking about the world is wrong. And that can have really deep effects for confidence, which then can roll over to self-esteem issues. And when you're already facing racism and compounded effects of other representational matters, it can be really, really traumatizing and and disempowering, and it can lead to a lot of emotional breakdown. So it sounds like you're you're essentially pointing to a, a kind of arrogance on the part of you know allopathic medicine, Western biomedical approaches, and kind of assuming that they have the answers, they know what the the disease is, and they have the cure. 
Well, it's uh, in, in some cases it can seem to be an arrogance for sure. Um, I think that's more on the individual practitioner's level. I think that mm. there's there's a definite hubris though, and it's not just to medicine; it's to Western science, where we assume that you know, just as we talk about the university, the one voice where all of the voices are brought together in a sort of singular choir, and all knowledge can be isolated in the same sets, the same patterns, right? Mm-hmm. That um, that we sort of see within medicine the suggestion that it knows best how to adjudicate what people are talking about, but it may not care about interpreting the language those people are using very well. It may mm. think that that language issue is something else. That's another specialist's problem. And mm. so when ways of understanding oneself are embedded within language and we simply discard the importance of language, it's troubling in the sense that science assumes to to bring in all of these different voices, but then fails to translate them well or to leave them untranslated in some situations and to mm-hmm. accept that what they're seeing is something that science hasn't seen yet. Yeah, and kind of on this topic, I, I like this quote uh, of yours. You said, the failure of white medicine is simultaneously its inability to accept alternative ontologies of illness and disease and its stubborn refusal to allow indigenous people space to heal on their own. So I'm curious in the context of what you're talking about, have you, have you encountered kind of alternative healing methods or or do you think that indigenous people should engage with uh, Western practitioners? Do you think that Western practitioners should, should sort of change somehow or do you think that they should Indigenous people should kind of go off on their own and just not deal with that at all. Well, my first sort of point would be that I'm just one voice and I wouldn't really want to prescribe a whole, a whole set for any particular person. Sure. Um, And I mean, that's, that seems sort of obvious, I guess, but also it's, it's really important to me that I don't overgeneralize. I do think that science and Western medicine have a great deal to offer, and there's no reason that they should be discarded or disregarded. I think that that would be swinging the pendulum far too much in one direction. I mean, once the box is opened, you can't put everything back in, yeah? Right. There's no erasing what's been done. That said, I think that it's a situation where Indigenous peoples who are experts in their own right, need to be recognized as experts. This has been something, you know, long ago Gramsci argued that if you want to look at factory workers and understand factory workers, you don't talk to academics. You talk about you talk to the factory worker who likes to think about things. Mm. And likewise, anthropologists have been doing that in a lot of communities. We recognize that not everyone in a community wants to talk about or think about how their society works or how societies interact. And so it's not everybody's sort of way. But I do think that that it's really important, for instance, in northern communities where we have nursing stations, we don't have a physician on site. Um, at best, they can get a hold of them on the telephone, and they're serving communities perhaps as large as 2,500 people, 3,000 people, that some of the community members in the area should be recognized as people who hold traditional medical knowledge. Mm -hmm. Um, There's going to be women who are skilled in the equivalent of midwifery. There's going to be people who are counselors. There's going to be people who are uh, healers in the sense that they're skilled practitioners of group therapy sessions. Often this is just something we would say as a talking circle, and we would talk about it as something that just happens at pretty much every communal meeting. But the the thing is that there was no topic off the table at any given community meeting. If something's troubling you and you've got a community meeting, you bring it up and you each are given the time to do that. Each person is valued as a member of the community. And so in that sense, it's critical that we move away from assuming or presuming that people don't have any knowledge of how to look after themselves and that we start assuming that they have different ways of looking after themselves that might be, yes, improved upon, 
but improved upon from within the pattern of the culture or the tradition that we're looking at, rather than by subsuming or assimilating that culture in some way. I hope that that sort of speaks better to the question, I think. It does. I mean, the, the way you're making it sound with the community meetings, for example, I mean, it sounds like Western medicine could probably learn something from some of these indigenous groups. I mean, psychology and psychiatry are only, you know, 150 years old. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and this is part of the issue with, you know, scientific approaches in general. Anthropology has taken a scientific approach to evolution and human difference psychology has taken a somewhat scientific approach. Some would argue, you know, that there's alternatives now, but initially the point was to professionalize all of these disciplines and to make sure that they had something to offer. So looking at them in context, there's nothing wrong with trying to to suggest that there is a reason to take a particular methodological approach and that that can offer something unique. The trouble is when we suggest that any particular discipline has the whole picture. I think that that's where the West really needs to learn, because when we talk about a healing circle, we're also talking about restorative justice. There's no line between those things within the community. So if someone's been wronged, it's not a justice issue. That's the way that a particular set of community members are going to focus on the issue. That's their responsibility. And this is sort of what's passed down through different clan membership um, traditions And the like where, for instance, amongst the Algonquin, the bears are responsible for justice. People from within the bear clan tend to be taught to think about issues of justice. So when they're listening to, say, a domestic dispute issue in a community conversation, what they're going to be concerned with is making sure that there is a just outcome. But that doesn't mean that that's the only thing that's going on. For the cranes, they're going to be thinking about how people are speaking, the rhetoric, the way that they're talking, and whether or not that speech is damaging or something that can be used to bridge the different approaches that are being offered between two people who have a dispute. So there's different responsibilities in the community, and it's important that people recognize those responsibilities. And we can liken that to the way that the disciplines Yes, they take different approaches, but they need to be in conversation and they need to recognize that it's not just the authorities, the recognized authorities who can offer important sort of perspectives on different issues. Sometimes the people closest to them are the ones who know the most. And I I could see how psychiatrists or psychologists or therapists coming into these communities could uh, do some damage if they if they come in with kind of this. this uh, self-perceived expertise and status and like, you know, we have the, the answer and uh, cause it sounds like from what you're saying there, there's a lot of expertise within the communities themselves already. I'm curious about any other kind of implications around healing that your work has, has brought out for you. Well, I would say that um, at first I sort of took with a grain of salt the idea that they set aside the park um, in order to have uh, a place of health resort, as they said. Mm. I thought that was kind of funny. I thought, of course, people like to go out to the woods and stuff like that, but I didn't really understand at the time the profound implications of being on the land, in particular for people who have such a deep historically grounded relationship with particular places. And so there's places within Algonquin Park where there are pictographs, burial sites, religious sites, village sites, all kinds of archaeological remains all over the place, burials where we're not going to know where all of these places are. Mm. Um, we're not going to be able to find them. And I'm not really sure that the point would be to find each of them and point out where those sites are. The point is that indigenous people were everywhere and that the Algonquin people were always in this place. And so it's a, a peopled landscape. And when we think about places like this, we often think of them as places without people or what have you, and that we get out there to get away from one another. But it's really more about grounding ourselves on the land and building up the stories that make us feel at home. And so I think that it's 
become much more obvious to me over time that part of the reason why I wanted to do the research that I do, where sometimes I go out for camping trips, sometimes I go for hikes and go walk around at the visitor center and museum, or we'll go car camping at the different campgrounds. Sometimes we paddle in and we're in there for, you know, a week as much as that with just my family and my dog. And we really don't talk to anybody else. And some people would be confused about how that could be anthropological work. What kind of cultural study am I doing by isolating myself with my family in the woods? But there's people out there. If you start to realize, you know, that the animals themselves see themselves as people and that your relationship to the eagles that come by every day or to the chickadee that pops by your campsite are important and that they can be just as important as the relationships that we have to other people in the city that we take for granted on a daily basis, where we ignore what's seen as natural because we're so focused on the cultural. And so I think it's really important to break down those barriers between the natural and the cultural, but also to recognize that as in particular for indigenous people who sort of show that they are involved in relational and ontologies, that being on the land is a matter of not just identity, but, but health. You, you can't be yourself if you can't be with the people who make you who you are. And sometimes those people are places. Sometimes the trees are your ancestors. And I think that that's a really profound difference but it works hand in hand with recent research that's shown us that both mental and physical health are connected to being on the land, that our, our physical well-being depends on having a little bit of dirt under our fingernails, getting out into the sunshine, breathing clean air, not recycled stale air from within bedrooms and the like. And so all of this stuff, I think, has, has compounded presence that we need to recognize in particular for people who, who participate in a different imaginative relationship with the land. Yeah, and it, it's, it's interesting, the, the research that you bring up in psychology and whatnot, because I, I do feel like there's something to be learned from a, a relational worldview, a relational perspective, um, you know, because e- even this research, though it's maybe getting at something in terms of our the necessity of being closer to to nature and whatnot, it still kind of uh, objectifies things and says, "Oh, well, you know, if you want to, if you want to heal, then take your your daily walk through the park and uh, very in a very objectifying kind of way, rather than sort of seeing it relationally." That sounds really important. Yeah, absolutely. It's that it's about the organisms that get in contact with the skin of your feet when you walk barefoot outside, not about the feel of your feet on the land, right? Because that's Mm. not important. How you feel isn't important, but somehow this is still about mental health. It should be baffling to us that we can isolate things this way. Okay. Uh, Well, that's about all that I have, but uh, any final comments or thoughts? I'm thankful for the opportunity to talk about this. I hope that some of your audience can learn something from it and that, you know, in the midst of all of this global emergency, we can reflect on maybe the need to be on the land in a different way. We're talking about a virus that's probably been caused by ecological collapse and the sort of high pace of interconnected lives where our personal health is failing in a lot of ways in order to favor things that don't benefit many of us individually. I think we need a rethink and part of that needs to be focused on getting back to the land. And that's not just for indigenous people. That's something that settlers need to learn from indigenous people. That if we want to become people who belong here, we need to show responsibility for the land, not just the right to make use of it. Mm -hmm. And that gets back to our treaty responsibilities as well. So I think I think there's a lot to reflect on there and people should probably start learning about what original agreements govern their relationship to the land. Who were the people that are on the land that you live on? Are they still there? What are their stories and how do your stories articulate with them? All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Pepe. Thank you, Micah. I appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. 
visit madinamerica.com for more news, views and updates.